welcome back. You're listening across the border. This is our Prophecy Reality Edition. And because prophecy is history in advance, we also uh, like to delve into history. It confirms our prophecy. And uh, in this segment, uh, we're, uh, I'm, it's going to take probably years to finish this one. It's quite a lengthy thing. So, uh, yeah, I hope you're really interested in history. Now, I've read this book twice myself, and now I'm reading it for the third time on the air to you. And the name of this book is The History of Protestantism by James A. Wiley. And we're in Volume 1, Book 1, and Chapter 4. The Papacy from Gregory Seven to Boniface Eight. We come now to the last great struggle. There lacked one grade of power to complete and crown this stupendous fabric of dominion. The spiritual supremacy was achieved in the seventh century. The temporal sovereignty was attained in the eighth. It wanted only that the pontifical supremacy sometimes although improperly styled the temporal supremacy to make the Pope supreme over kings, as he had already become over peoples and bishops, and to vest in him a jurisdiction that has not its like on earth, a jurisdiction that is unique inasmuch as it arrogates all power, absorbs all rights, and spurns all limits, destined before terminating its career, to crush beneath its iron foot thrones and nations, and making an ambition as astute as Lucifer's with a dissimulation as profound. This power advanced at first with noiseless steps, and stole upon the world as night steals upon it. But, as it neared the goal, its strides grew longer and swifter till at last it vaulted over the throne of monarchs into the seat of God. This great war we shall now proceed to consider when the popes, at an early stage, claimed to be the vicars of Christ. They virtually challenged that boundless jurisdiction of which their proudest era beheld them in actual possession. But they knew that it would be imprudent, indeed impossible, as yet to assert it in actual fact. Their motto was spes messes and semine, discerning the harvest in the seed. They were content, meanwhile, to lodge the principle of supremacy in their creed, and in the general mind of Europe, knowing that future ages would fructify and ripen it. Towards this, they began to work quietly, yet skillfully and preservingly. At length came overt and open measures. Now, the year 1073, the papal chair was filled by perhaps the greatest of all popes, Gregory VII the noted Hildebrand, daring and ambitious beyond all who had preceded and beyond most of those who have followed him on the papal throne. Gregory fully grasped the idea of theocracy. He held that the reign of the Pope was but another name for the reign of God, and he resolved never to rest till that idea had been realized in the subjection of all authority and power, spiritual and temporal, to the chair of Peter. When he drew out, says Janus, the whole system of papal omnipotence in the 27th thesis in his Dictatus, these theses were partly mere repetitions or corollaries of the Isidorian decretals. Partly he and his friends sought to give them the appearance of tradition and antiquity by new fictions. We may take the following as samples. The eleventh maxim says, The Pope's name is the chief name in the world. The twelfth teaches that it is lawful for him to depose emperors, and the eighteenth affirms that his decision is to be withstood by none. 
but he alone may annul those of all men. The 19th declares that he can be judged by no one. The 25th vests in him the absolute power of deposing and restoring bishops. And the 27th, the power of annulling the allegiance of subjects. Such was the gauge that Gregory flung down to the kings and nations of the world. We say of the world, for the pontifical supremacy embraced all who dwell upon the earth. Now began the war between the mitre and the empire. Gregory's object in this war being to wrest from the emperors the power of appointing the bishops and the clergy generally, and to assume into his own soul and irresponsible hands the whole of that intellectual and spiritual machinery by which Christendom was governed. The strife was a bloody one. The mitre, though sustaining occasional reverses, continued nevertheless to gain steadily upon the empire. The spirit of the times helped the priesthood in their struggle with the civil power. The age was superstitious to the core, and though in no wise spiritual, it was very thoroughly ecclesiastical. The Crusades, too, broke the spirit and drained the wealth of princes, while the growing power and augmenting riches of the clergy cast the balance ever more and more against the state. For a brief space, Gregory VII tasted, in his own case, the luxury of wielding this more than mortal power. There came a gleam through the awful darkness of the tempest he had raised, not final victory, which was yet a century distant, but its presage. He had the satisfaction of seeing the emperor, Henry IV of Germany, whom he had smitten with excommunication, barefooted, and in raiment of sackcloth, waiting three days and nights at the castle gates of Canosa amid the winter drifts, suing for forgiveness. But it was for a moment only that Hildebrand stood on this dazzling pinnacle. The fortune of war very quickly turned. Henry, the man whom the Pope had so sorely humiliated, became victor in his turn. Gregory died, an exile on the promontory of Salerno. But his successors espoused his project and strove by wiles, by arms, and by anathemas to reduce the world under the scepter of the papal theocracy. For nearly two dismal centuries, the conflict was maintained. How truly melancholy the record of these times. It exhibits to our sorrowing gaze many a stricken field, many an empty throne, many a city sacked, many a spot deluged with blood. But through all this confusion and misery, the idea of Gregory was preservingly pursued till at last it was realized and the mitre was beheld triumphant over the empire. It was the fortune or the calamity of Innocent III, 1198 to 1216, to celebrate this great victory. Now it was the pontifical supremacy reached its fullest development. One man, one will again govern the world. It is with a sort of stupefied awe that we look back to the 13th century and see in the foreground of the recording of the receding storm this colossus uprearing itself in the person of Innocent III. On its head all the mitres of the church and in its hand all the scepters of the state. In each of the three leading objects which Rome has pursued, says Hallam, independent sovereignty, supremacy over the Christian church, control over the princes of the earth, it was the fortune of this pontiff to conquer. Rome, he says again, inspired during this age all the terror of her ancient name. 
she was once more mistress of the world, and kings were her vassals. She had fought a great fight, and now she celebrated an unequaled triumph. Innocent appointed all bishops. He summoned to his tribunal all causes, from the gravest affairs of mighty kingdoms to the private concerns of the humble citizen. He claimed all kingdoms as his fiefs, all monarchs as his vassals, and launched with unsparing hand the bolts of excommunication against all who withstood his pontifical will. Hildebrand's idea was now fully realized. The pontifical supremacy was beheld in its plenitude, the plenitude of spiritual power and that of temporal power. It was the noon of the papacy, but the noon of the papacy was the midnight of the world. The grandeur which the papacy now enjoyed and the jurisdiction it wielded have received dog dogmatic expression and one or two selections will enable it to paint itself as it was seen in its noon. Pope Innocent III affirmed that the pontifical authority so much exceeded the royal power as the sun doth the moon. Nor could he find words fitly to describe his own formidable functions, save those of Jehovah or Yahuwah to his prophet Jeremiah. See, I have set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down. The church, my spouse, we find the same Pope saying, is not married to me without bringing me something. She hath given me a dowry of a price beyond all price, the plenitude of spiritual things and the extent of of things temporal, the greatness and abundance of both. She had given me the mitre in token of spiritual things, the crown in token of the temporal, the mitre for the priesthood, and the crown for the kingdom, making me the lieutenant of him who hath written upon his vesture and on his thigh the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I enjoy alone the plenitude of power that others may say of me next to God, and out of his fullness have we received. We declare, says Boniface, 1294 to 1303, in his bull, Unum Sanctum, define, pronounce it to be necessary to salvation for every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. This subjection is declared in the bull to extend to all affairs, one sword, says the Pope, must be under another, and the temporal authority must be subject to the spiritual authority. Whence, if the earthly power go astray, it must be judged by the spiritual. Such are a few of the great words which were heard to issue from the Vatican Mount, that new Sinai, which, like the old, encompassed by fiery terrors, has upreared itself in the midst of of the astonished and affrighted nations of Christendom. What a contrast between the first and the last estate of the pastors of the Roman Church, between the humility and poverty of the first century and the splendor and power in which the thirteenth saw them enthroned. This contrast has not escaped the notice of the greatest Italian poets. Dante, in one of his lightning flashes, has brought it before us. He describes the first pastors of the church as coming, barefoot and lean, eating their bread as chanced at the first table, and addressing Peter, he says, In thou went forth in poverty and hunger to set the goodly plant that, from the vine, it once was, now is grown unsightly bramble. Petrarch dwells repeatedly and with more amplification on the same theme. We quote only the last, the first and last stanzas of his sonnet on the Church of Rome. The fire of wrathful heaven alight and all thy harlot tresses smite. 
base city, thou from humble fair, thy acorns and thy water rose, to greatness rich with others' woes, rejoicing in the ruin di thou didst bear. In former days thou wast not laid, on down nor under cooling shade, thou naked to the winds wast given, and through the sharp and thorny road, thy feet without the sandals trod, but now thy life is such it smells to heaven. There's something here out of the ordinary course. We have no desire to detract from the worldly wisdom of the popes. They were, in that respect, the ablest race of rulers the world ever saw. Their enterprise soared as high above the vastest scheme of other potentates and conquerors, as their ostensible means of achieving it fell below theirs. To build such a fabric of dominion upon the gospel, every line of which repudiates and condemns it, to impose it on the world without an army and without a fleet, to bow the necks, not of ignorant peoples only, but of mighty potentates to it, nay, to persuade the latter to assist in establishing a power which they could hardly but foresee would crush themselves, to pursue this scheme through a succession of centuries without once meeting any serious check or repulse, for the 130 popes between Boniface III and 606, who in partnership with Focus laid the foundations of the papal grandeur, and Gregory VII, who first realized it onward through another two centuries to Innocent III in 1216, and Boniface III in 1303, who at last put the top stone upon it, not one lost an inch of ground which his predecessor had gained. To do all this, we repeat, something out of the ordinary course. There is nothing like it again in the whole history of the world. This success, continued through seven centuries, was audaciously interpreted into a proof of the divinity of the papacy. Behold, it has been said, when the throne of Caesar was overturned, how the chair of Peter stood erect. Behold, when the barbarous nations rushed like a torrent into Italy, overwhelming laws, extinguishing knowledge and dissolving society itself, how the ark of the church rode in safety on the flood. Behold, when the victorious hosts of the Saracen approached the gates of Italy, how they were turned back. Behold, when the mitre waged its great conquest with the empire, how it triumphed. Behold, when the Reformation broke out and it seemed as if the kingdom of the Pope was numbered and finished, how three centuries have been added to its sway. Behold, in fine, when revolution broke out in France and swept like a whirlwind over Europe, bearing down thrones and dynasties, how the bark of Peter outlived the storm and rode triumphant above the waves that engulfed apparently stronger structures. Is not this the church of which Christ said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it? We're going to go into a break here in a few minutes uh, to finish this. We certainly can't leave it there. We're on uh, chapter 4 of volume 1, book 1 of uh, the history of Protestantism by James A. Wiley. Uh, I hope you're at least entertained by the history and uh, that you'll continue with me as we uh, continue on with this in the next hour. You're listening to Cross the Border, our prophecy reality, and should we say history reality edition. Uh, go to my website, crosstheborder.org. Make sure you subscribe to my blog there so you can keep up with what's going on and uh, take advantage of all the resources there. And if the Almighty uh, compels you, you could support FirstAmendmentRadio.com. We would appreciate it uh, very much. Uh, perhaps I could take a pay raise to $4 an hour. <laughs> uh, I'm not keeping track anyway. I'm just It's the way it feels sometimes, but uh, probably pretty close to reality too. Okay, where's that break? Coming any second now. 
Okay, we'll be back in a few minutes. Don't go anywhere. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a Third Temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Welcome back. You're listening to Cross the Border, our Prophecy Reality Edition. And uh, in this segment, uh, we're covering a little history reality because... Well, it's, it has happened. We have a record of what has happened in history and the reality of the situation. Well, we left off in uh, chapter 4 and the boast of uh, Cardinal Baronius saying, certainly the papacy, the Vatican, the Church of Rome is, has stamped upon it the authority of God because it has conquered the world. Boast here with the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He said, is, is, is not this the church of which Christ said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it? No, it's not. I would say that this is everything he's boasting of is evidence that this is that predicted anti-Christ world dominating power that would rule overtly for 1260 years in uh, over that beast power of the earth in the, the old Roman Empire for 1260 years. And we have history to back us up that it actually did happen and we're reading about that history at this very moment. So let's uh, pick back up here and continue right where we left off. What else do the words of Cardinal Baronius mean? Boasting of a supposed donation of the kingdom of, of Hungary to the Roman See by Stephen. He says, it fell out by a wonderful providence of God that at the very time when the Roman church might appear ready to fall and perish, even then 
distant kings approach the apostolic see, which they acknowledge and venerate as the only temple of the universe, the sanctuary of piety, <laughs> the pillar of truth, the immovable rock. Of course, now, this is, <laughs> this is one of their own, patting themselves on the back and building themselves up before the world, calling themselves all these wonderful things, the pillar of truth, the immovable rock, taking to themselves names that were, were only apply to Jesus Christ. They usurp his authority. That's why they're antichrist. They put themselves in his place. Behold, kings, not from these. Who's the king of kings? Is it the papacy? According to Baronius, it is, yes. Not from the east, as of old, they came to the cradle of Christ, but from the north, led by faith, they humbly approach the cottage of the fisher. <laughs> the church of Rome herself, offering not only gifts out of their treasures, but bringing even kingdoms to her and asking king kingdoms from her. Whoso is wise, and I will record these things, even he shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Thank you for that, Cardinal Baronius. And, uh, it's, uh, Peter had nothing to do with the Church of Rome. I know who established the Church of Rome because it's written in the New Testament. It was Paul. Paul, the, uh, the Apostle Paul, who established it. There was no first bishop of the church at Rome was not Peter. It's doubtful that Peter ever went to Rome, let alone all of the things that they've written about him since. And it's unlikely that Peter was crucified upside down in Rome. That's just a story that they made to embellish his appearance at Rome to be the first bishop there. That What was Paul? If he wasn't the first bishop uh, the, the, and the, the first apostle, of the Church of Rome. Peter never resided and governed over and put himself in a hierarchy over the Church at Rome. There's no evidence of that whatsoever, but let's get back to our history here uh, with uh, the after the audacious statement of this uh, Cardinal Baronius. But, and you can see all of this is footnoted, so you can check all this out from historical documents for yourself. You know, we, I mean, some of our best evidence of that the papacy is the, is the seat of the Antichrist comes from it, their own writings. Yeah, that's true. Continuing on here. But the success of the papacy, when closely examined, is not as surprising as it looks. It cannot be justly pronounced legitimate or fairly won. Rome has ever been swimming with the tide. The evils and passions of society, which a true benefactress would have made it her business to cure, at least to alleviate, Rome has studied rather to foster into strength, that she might be born to power on the foul current which she herself has had created amid battles, bloodshed, and confusion has her path lain. The edicts of subservient councils, the forgeries of hireling priests, the arms of craven monarchs, and the thunderbolts of excommunication have never been wanting to open her path. Exploits won by weapons of this sort are what her historians delight to chronicle. These are the victories that constitute her glory. And then there remains yet another and great deduction from the apparent grandeur of her success in that, after all, it is the success of only a few, a caste, the clergy. For although during her early career the Roman Church rendered certain important services to society, out of which, of which, it will delight us to make mention in fitting place when she grew to maturity and was able to develop her real genius it was felt and acknowledged by all that her principles implied the ruin of all interests save her own and that there was room in the world for none but herself in her march as shown in history down to the 16th century is ever onwards it is not less true 
that behind on her path lie the wrecks of nations and the ashes of literature, of liberty, and of civilization. Nor can we help observing that the career of Rome, with all the fictitious brilliance that encompasses it, is utterly eclipsed when placed beside the silent and sublime progress of the gospel. The latter we see winning its way over mighty obstacles solely by the force and sweetness of its own truth. It touches the deep wounds of society only to heal them. It speaks not to awaken, but to hush the rough voice of strife and war. It enlightens, purifies, and blesses men wherever it comes. And it does all this so gently and without boasting. Reviled, it reviles not again. For curses, it returns blessings. It unsheathes no sword. It spills no blood. Casts into chains, its victories are as many as when free, and more glorious, dragged to the stake and burned. From the ashes of the martyr there start up a thousand confessors, and sped on its career, and, and well the glory of its triumph. Compared with this, how different has been the career of Rome, as different, in fact, as the thunder cloud which comes onward, mantling the skies in gloom and scathing the earth with fiery bolts, is different from the morning descending from the mountain tops, scattering around it the silvery light and awakening at its presence songs of joy. So you've been listening to Cross the Border, a Prophecy Reality Edition. We've been going through the history of Protestantism Volume 1, Book 1, and Chapter 5. We'll pick up here next time. May the Almighty bless you and keep you as you walk the narrow way that leads to life. Till we meet again. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our listen and schedule pages on the internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening.